hola, estoy colonizado. Siempre te lo sentí así. Me gusta ser colonizado. Es lo único gratis que puedo hacer. No puedo imaginarme no ser colonizado. No way, Spider-Man's white? It's normal for people to have an existential crisis. Here's my reaction after watching a Kurz Kazak video. It's my go-to hobby, like, what else can I do besides that? I rest my case, but have you ever imagined what would happen if Waluigi became an actual fighter in Smash Brothers? It's the dream we desperately need no matter which console you're cited, but Sadly, that never happened, and all we can do is hope for Nintendo to put him in as an actual fighter. But, it's stuff like that that keeps the people like me from sleeping at night. What would happen if this happened rather than what actually happened? A lot of people have popularized the concept of what if. The term comes from the new Marvel show with the same name, showing off alternate realities within the MCU. What would happen if zombies attack New York? What would happen if you didn't stop talking non-stop? What would happen if your character collected all the most powerful items in the universe thereby making them too OP? It's a fun little concept that I've been really interested in, and you know what that means. I'm a cheap son of a bitch. I love gaming, I've probably said it a billion times before but I'll keep saying it, I'm not a coward. Now that I'm officially an outcast of society, I think it's high time to talk about things that never existed. Oh yeah, that's, that's totally fake. Throughout video game history, there are many things that were once shown to the public a handful of times but were never actually real or officially released or developed, such as cancelled video game projects and game consoles. And it's not just those, there were many instances where video game companies make decisions that would inevitably change them the way they are now, Nintendo abandoning its collaboration with Sony on the Nintendo PlayStation project is a popular example, like who knows what would happen if the project actually released. But it's not just corporate decisions we're talking about, it could even be decisions made during the development of a video game, what would happen if this one concept was changed during game development. It's these questions that pique our energy drink filled brains, and there are tons and tons of them out there. But if you were to ask my opinion, you've already lost. So today we're going to be going through a whole smorgasbord of what if gaming questions, and hear what I have to say about them. Now we're only going through a handful of what if questions, we're not going through all of them since it'll take a day to finish all those questions, and I'm sure someone out there has already done that, so if there are, go ahead and hear what they have to say. But if you want to hear the unvalued opinion of a cryptic Lego Marvel superheroes addicted loner nerd, then you've come to the right place. In the early stages of video games, the consoles were all pretty much alike. Same controls, same graphics, even the games themselves, though with different titles, functioned pretty much the same. That is until Nintendo came into the scene with their own gaming console, the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1983 followed by the Sega Master System in 1985. As we all know, Nintendo and Sega were and still are great rivals, so their rivalry has somewhat toned down these recent years, we cannot forget how much of a spark their rivalry ignited during their peak. But that begs the question, what if Nintendo and Sega never became rivals? Well, let's look at the pros first. If Nintendo and Sega were never rivals, we would have had a much earlier crossover between Mario and Sonic characters. Could you imagine two of the most popular video game characters at the time joining forces in a single game? I would squee. We might have had a crossover game much earlier like Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games but for the third generation of gaming and onwards. Maybe the N64 Smash Bros game would have included Sonic characters much earlier, maybe even a joint console project like the cancelled Nintendo PlayStation project. This would have been a dream come true, imagine Sonic and the crew racing against Mario Karts, Bowser and Eggman joining together to stop Mario and Sonic, Luigi sucking Eggman, the possibilities are endless. But like my happiness, things come to an end. Because Nintendo and Sega were never rivals, either one of them would have less competition. This would be good for them because they would dominate the gaming industry, but because they have little to no competition, there's no need to innovate their products or take any more risks. We might never have the SNES and Sega Genesis, the N64 and the Sega Saturn, or the GameCube and the Dreamcast. 
all of these popular games and consoles from these generations to the current generation could have ceased to exist if this scenario had happened, and we could have witnessed yet another video game crash, much like what happened with the Atari. Plus, without the rivalry, I don't think Mario and Sonic would be as popular as they are today. Think about it, the whole reason we all know and love about the two is that they were rivals. The marketing campaign between the SNES and the Sega Genesis was popular because they were literally trying to one-up the other. Without the rivalry, all of this would be worthless and forgotten from gaming history. For me personally, the rivalry between Nintendo and Sega during their early stages is what made them popular and well known to everyone in the world. To prove this, let's take a look back at the Dreamcast. Of course, this console didn't do too well and because of that, Sega officially announced that they would no longer be making any future gaming consoles, but would still continue developing and publishing games. From then on, the most viable platforms to publish games would be on an Xbox or PlayStation or both. But not a lot of people expected Sega, of all platforms, to publish their games on their once was rival Nintendo. Thus, Nintendo and Sega have put aside the rivalry and the two managed to release the best games of all time. Some. And they finally made games featuring both Mario and Sonic. It was brand new and exciting at the time, but eventually, this crossover just kind of died out of popularity. It's still exciting seeing Mario and Sonic both featured in a brand new game, but it's no longer exciting really. If this happened in the late 80s or in the early 90s, their popularity would have declined much earlier. A video game crash would have likely happened in this case. But it also begs another question. What if Atari never crashed in the 80s? The whole shtick of why a video game crash happened in the first place was because of multiple reasons. The market was flooded with games being almost exact clones of each other, publishers opted for quantity over quality, showing very little control over the quality of their final products. Consumers didn't have confidence and trust in the products and stopped buying as many games. And lastly, the computer market had started to grow and release more unique titles than their console counterparts. If Atari didn't crash, they would have a monopoly on the home console market much earlier than Nintendo and have a far greater impact on the video game industry. Of course, Nintendo and Sega would eventually reach their way to the states and establish new competitions within the gaming industry, but Atari might actually be a much fiercer competitor in this scenario. Maybe the Atari Jaguar and the Atari Lynx would have become actual great video game consoles. Maybe Atari would have published actual great games that aren't just stuck to the past and are innovating the gaming landscape. Maybe they would also create new and original characters that might become as iconic as Master Chief. So, hands. We use them every day, save for some special folk. And for us gamers, our hands are made for a few reasons. Mainly, mashing the A button, holding a controller, playing on a mouse and keyboard, and mashing the A button. Imagine if we have to lay down our controllers and use our actual hands to play a video game. This is depressing. What if motion gaming accessories didn't fail? By this, I meant those weird console doodads like the Kinect or the PS3 Move controller. These were somewhat big in the late 2000s, the era in which I was born. I was so into Kinect games, primarily dancing games, and I loved using this thing but as time went on, it became a bit weird to use. In the end, you're just flailing your arms around the air with this thing, it doesn't feel right. And eventually, these types of peripherals died out in the mid 2000s. Now the PS4 and PS5 controllers and the Switch Joy-Cons do have motion capabilities and are used in a handful of games, but those are built in with the actual controllers that you're most likely to use for more traditional games, i.e. those that are not motion based. So I wouldn't really consider these as motion gaming accessories. VR isn't in here also because it's mainly its own thing. If motion gaming accessories like these didn't fail, they would have a lot less negative press and would have evolved much rapidly. More games would have utilized this technology, maybe motion based games would become as popular and influential just as traditional video games. All I'm saying here is that if Xbox didn't discontinue the Kinect, we would have had another Dance Central game. Those games are far better than Just Dance. Speaking of discontinuations, what if Nintendo partnered with Sony for the Nintendo PlayStation? 
Nintendo was the king of the gaming industry during the late 80s, with the NES and SNES reigning supreme over the market. But as history tells, Sony would rise to the throne and become the next superior gaming competitor for the years to come. We all know Nintendo and Sony make most of the best games of all time, not only that but their consoles as well. If they merged together and, and released the Nintendo PlayStation, the console would have been the most powerful and attractive console ever created at the time. It's likely that this console would have dominated the market and that the entire industry would have changed direction. Xbox and Sega would probably never have existed. Because Nintendo and PlayStation joined forces to develop their own console, Xbox and Sega might have done the same thing. This scenario would be really interesting, gaming companies creating partnerships with other gaming companies to develop their own console and try to outmatch other companies doing the same thing is such an awesome thing to behold. Maybe we might have got to see Crash Bandicoot or Spyro cross over with a bunch of Nintendo characters, develop a Smash Brothers game with popular PlayStation characters. A good one. Maybe we can get a Nintendo character cameo in a PlayStation exclusive title and vice versa. For this specific scenario, it would be pretty difficult to figure out what might happen if the Nintendo PlayStation ruled over the industry. Would other game consoles cease to exist? Would Xbox stop making consoles and only develop games? Or maybe, would the Nintendo and PlayStation actually fail as a brand? We don't know for sure, but one thing is certain. Nintendo, as great of a video game company as it is, isn't the best at making decisions. Nintendo is a quality company, with an asterisk. They have done some pretty weird stuff, especially when they're suing the developers behind Power World, a Pokemon ripoff that's actually a much better game than a new Pokemon game. Instead of putting in effort to improve that game, they filed lawsuits against the people who were behind the development of Power World. This is one of many examples, but there was one that I cannot forgive. Selling Rare. What if Nintendo never sold Rare, and what if Nintendo bought Rare back? If you don't know Rare, they're the guys who were behind the Donkey Kong Country series, Donkey Kong 64, Banjo-Kazooie. They also carried the entire first few years of the Nintendo 64, with games like Perfect Dark and GoldenEye 007. Basically, Rare produced a ton of popular titles for the NES and all the way up to the GameCube and was one of Nintendo's best known video game developers. But the reason why Nintendo sold Rare was because they didn't see much value in the future. Well, that age will. If Nintendo never sold them, Rare would have been one of the biggest and most influential developers in video game history. They were, and their legacy would still continue if this happened. We might have gotten a sequel to Donkey Kong 64, a proper sequel to Banjo-Kazooie, and a more fleshed out series for each of these titles. I have a huge respect for these titles, and it's a shame we didn't get to see more of these developed and released. But I never grew up with Nintendo, you can tell by my incapability to buy merchandise. But I play Metroid. Go on, ask me questions, I can prove I played Metroid Fusion. Hello and welcome back to Know It All or None It All, a show where people admit they've failed basic education and embarrass themselves in local TV. For our first contestant, we have... How do I pronounce her name? That's the neat part, you don't. Alrighty then. For our first question, who is the main character in the Metroid series? Oh, 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 uh, uh, that's easy. Uh, Salmon. Yeah, police? Yeah, I think we found the suspect. Now you might ask, what happened to Rare? You're not gonna like it. After Nintendo sold Rare to Microsoft, Rare had done some games for the original Xbox, most notably a remaster of Conker's Bad Fur Day from the Nintendo 64. Not only that, but they also made Perfect Dark Zero, right where it belongs, in the backlog. For the Kinect fans out there, you might not have realized that Rare actually developed the mainline Kinect sports series, but prior to their release, Rare developed 
yeah, I'm starting to see why they're slowing failing. Now they are still developing games, Sea of Thieves is still getting a bunch of updates and DLCs, and they're also working on an upcoming game called Everwild. The last update we heard of this game was nearly 3 years ago, but what happened to Rare's more popular titles? Banjo, Conkers, what about them? So what if Rare continued making titles for both of these series? If Rare continued these games, they would have been completely revitalized. Instead of this or this, we might get more fleshed out titles for both of these series. Imagine Banjo-Kazooie or Conkers in the form of a Super Mario Odyssey. New innovative gameplay for both franchises and a step up in the right direction. Plus, we might get proper spin-off titles for each franchise. We might get a Conkers multiplayer shooter like Halo or Gears of War. Moreover, these two franchises can bring some variety to Xbox's exclusive library. As much as I love Xbox, their exclusive library was never really the best. We got Forza, Halo, Gears of War, 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 Ori. Throughout the years, the library barely felt any different until the arrival of indie games like Ori and The Will of the Wisp and Cuphead. But if Banjo and Conquer still develop games, it would be a breath of fresh air for Xbox fans, which is what Xbox really needs, more variety. I love variety, just because I'm an Xbox guy doesn't mean I can talk shit about that PlayStation or Nintendo. And scrolling through Nintendo's past, a part of me just begs the question, how is this a video game console? What if the Wii had a normal controller? No Wii remotes, no nunchucks, no motion controls, no pointers. Just a regular, traditional video game controller. If the Wii had a traditional controller instead of the iconic Wii remote, things would change incredibly. Without motion controls, games would have been designed for the plain old video game controller, with no gimmicks and stuff, resulting in completely different gameplay mechanisms. For me, it's very likely that without the unique Wii controller, the console itself would not have been as successful. The whole appeal of the Wii is the motion controls. Even ex exclusive titles like Wii Sports are tailored with motion controls in mind. You can't take the very purpose of something and expect it to still work. Like, what should I drink when I'm thirsty? An atom of oxygen? White Castle has some serious competition, I tell you that. Now I'm a bit of a lunatic and I like imagining what things would be like if they were their own polar opposites. Like, look ma, I drew the Mona Lisa. I'm pretty fast at drawing so I'm going to need to speed through the next lot of questions cause there's a whole lot of them. What if GTA had been a family friendly franchise? We already have one. What if Dark Souls had never spawned the genre? <laughs> what if the Witcher series was a success? Then maybe we would still have Henry Cavill in the show. What if Fortnite never introduced Battle Royale? Thank God. What if Bethesda RBGs like Skyrim never embraced mods? Then how am I going to pillow a cheese wheel? What if Half-Life 2 had ended on a cliffhanger? That's not a question, that was a fact. Half-Life 3 will be released in a billion light years, it's never gonna happen. What if the Earthbound or Mother series was released worldwide and is still a reoccurring franchise to this day? PLEASE NINTENDO! What if the Power Glove had become a standard gaming controller? FINALLY SOME IMMERSION! What if Rock Band was as successful as Just Dance? It's better than free speech, I'll tell you that. What if LEGO Marvel Super Heroes didn't exist? No. What if I stopped talking? I will.